So, here is the big, big claim that whatever, whatever we experience, we experience in consciousness. That was the first claim. The second claim is whatever is experienced in consciousness is an appearance in consciousness. It's not an external reality. So, this is one big problem for those who claim that there is a physical external world quite apart from consciousness. How would you know that at all? Except through consciousness. And this is, it goes back in Indian philosophy, at least it goes back um, at the very least to the Buddhist mind only school, the Vijnanavada school, Yoga Chara Vijnanavada school, more than 2000 years ago. In Western thought, in Western philosophy, very clearly it goes back to at least Bishop Berkeley, the subjectivist, uh, subjective idealist. Um, I was reading in the book of dead philosophers how Bishop Berkeley passed away. So he had a very um, dismissive view of death because his idea was everything exists in the mind. So the body is also like a thought in the mind. If the body goes away, what's the problem? It's not a big deal. Body is not, I'm not really the body, I'm the mind. And so I was reading, today I read for the first time how he died. He says he died with uh, a great deal of immateriality. <laughs> he, he sat down and uh, he was, somebody was reading a passage from Greek philosophy to him and he passed away in there. <laughs> and so so very, very lucky huh? <laughs> to pass away like that. So that's the big problem. How do you prove that there is an external world independent of mind? Now, this can get a very this argument can get very sophisticated. Those who are particle physicists or was working at the cutting edge of physics, which I don't understand. It's far it's far too sophisticated and very dense. But it seems to me they are now talking about the involvement of the observer, the involvement of consciousness at the most fundamental level of the universe, which is amazing, which is crazy actually. For a worldview, it says consciousness came much later. Universe was there for billions of years and some chance led to the evolution of life on this little mud puddle called the earth. And then the life evolved through dinosaurs and stuff like that and to until we had sophisticated nervous systems and brains and somehow we had consciousness. All of that somehow have come. And now we have consciousness. The universe existed, pre-existed before consciousness. This idea is now, it seems, apparently, those who do physics, they'll know much better than me, is being challenged that somewhere at the most fundamental level of the universe, consciousness is implicated, that you need an observer, it seems, for, uh, I don't know, the, part my, the particle wave duality, uh, collapse of the wave function, things like that. I'm just repeating like, like a parrot. I don't understand these things. So anyway, whether you take it from the philosophical perspective or from cutting-edge physics, it seems you cannot do away with the observing consciousness as far as the physical universe is concerned. All right, that's one point. The second point is you're claiming that the world is there and there are the bodies and brains and brains somehow generate consciousness. But the question is how? How? How do brains generate consciousness? If you think about it, it's a, it's a stunning claim. Everything in this universe that we see has only one aspect, the physical aspect. Inside, outside, it's just physical. But you are saying there is only one kind of physical thing, the brain, in our skulls, the brains, which have two aspects. One is the physical thing itself, which is the brain, but one a strange kind of uh, inner subjectivity. Something like it feels like we're within. We, it feels, you know, it, all of us, we have this inner first person feeling. It feels like something to see color here, to feel warmth, to listen to sounds. It feels like something. Why are we conscious at all? How is it that the brain, the brain could be a biological organ like everything else. Why does it have that unique property of being conscious internally, which is a, which is a subjective state? Nothing in the universe has a subjective state. How did one organ suddenly develop a subjective state? How did it go from the objective to the subjective? It's what's called a category mistake. You are jump, making a category jump. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. Anyway, enough said. What I'm saying is, this idea that consciousness is fundamental is not as crazy as it sounds. It may sound crazy to us, you know, we are not doing deep philosophy or deep science, it may sound crazy to us. But those who are doing deep philosophy and deep science, it does not sound crazy anymore. Where was I reading this? Oh, Swami Vivekananda. He was, he was always ready to jump in defense of the underdog. And in this case, the child. We think it's childish. He says a child sees person in everything. You know, that all these things have some kind of, it's just like my little friends, they're persons. So my toys are also persons and the tree is a person and the rock is a person and so on. Child imagines persons everywhere. 
And as we grow up, uh, the one process of being adult is we grow out of that thing of seeing um, an animate universe. We grow out of it and uh, we have a rational worldview. No, these are not persons. These are all just things. There are some persons. We are desperately trying to not to treat them as things also, but they are persons. And the world is dominated by things and a few persons scattered here and there. And I'm a person. So this is supposed to be adult. This is supposed to be rational. And it is. And then we dismiss the idea that you know, things are personal. I remember a child's mind. Parents understand this. Sometimes mothers better than fathers. I remember about 20 years ago, I was visiting a friend of mine and there was a little boy, who is of course a grown-up young man now. Was, um, uh, this little boy, he was playing in the corner. I was talking to his father, my friend. And the boy, he bumped into a, a sofa set, the couch. And he hurt himself a little bit and started wailing. And the father, see, both of them tried to comfort him, the father and then the mother. But see, the totally di different approach. The father said, oh, it's nothing. Don't be such a baby. It's, it's, oh, look, you're not hurt at all. There's, there's nothing there. Just stop crying. All true. It's true. But all entirely irrelevant for the child. The child wailed even louder. <laughs> and then the mother comes along uh, to quieten the child. And the mother says, Oh, let me see. You're hurt. It's so awful. The couch is very naughty, isn't it? And the boy said, yes. And should, I, should I hit the couch? The boy said, yes. And hit, and mother hit the couch. Hit it harder? Yes. And hit it harder. More? The boy said, no, it's okay. Because <laughs> he's friends with the couch. <laughs> the sense of justice has been served. There's this other being which hurt me and deserves to be hurt in return. And once it's been hurt, the thing is settled. So it imbues with personality. Vivekananda rushes to the defense of the child. He says, don't you see that the child sees everything with personality? We grow out of it. But only afterwards when we grow, we come back to it. When we go, you know, when we become more philosophical and more spiritual, then we begin to see an all-pervading oneness, a divine oneness everywhere. And realize, in a certain sense, the child was right. <laughs> in a certain sense. In a childish way, maybe. So the saint is childlike. The child is childish. There's a world of difference. But there is something there that it is, there is one consciousness everywhere. Okay. So if you try to think that there's an external world and that world has developed brains and brains have developed consciousness, you have to answer two big questions. The paradox, the, the question about idealism. How do you know anything without consciousness? And the second question would be the problem of the hard, the hard problem of consciousness. How does a physical thing develop suddenly a subjective side uh, consciousness? All right. So world, the universe is an appearance in you, the awareness. It's so huge. Now, further. Notice that in the mirror, the city in the mirror, nothing that happens in the city in the mirror affects the mirror. I'm working my way, drilling down into the implications. Nothing that happens. Suppose there is a flood in the city in the mirror. Does the mirror become wet a little bit? little moisture? No. Nothing at all. Not one drop of moisture. Shankaracharya says, all the water in a mirage is not enough to wet one grain of sand in the desert. Why? You see the water and you see the desert, so why shouldn't the desert be wet by that water? Because they, though you see both, they are not both at the same level of reality. One is real, the sand, the other one, the mirage, is an appearance. One is real, the mirror, and the other one, the city in the mirror, is an appearance. If there is a catastrophe in the city, in the mirror, like an explosion, does the mirror get hot or burnt? Not at all. And why not? Because the appearance cannot affect the reality. No matter how terrible the things are happening in a movie, the movie screen is not affected by them. You can have space battles going on in the movie and the movie screen won't be affected by it. You can have King Kong come and tear down New York, but the screen on which the movie is playing, not one tear will be there, not one scratch on the screen. That's because King Kong and New York are at one level of reality and the screen is at a deeper level of reality. It's more real. Both are experienced. But one is real, the other one is an appearance. Appearance does not affect, improve, damage, harm, reality. The city in the mirror can do nothing for the mirror. Oh, the mirror will look a little prettier. That's true, with a city in it. If it's just a mirror, blank mirror, nothing being reflected, it's boring. 
But is the city in the mirror? It's, so we'll say it's the glory of the mirror. The city in the mirror is the glory of the mirror. It, it's, uh, it's what the mirror can do. Nothing that happens in the world can affect you, the awareness. I, you, the awareness is not affected by anything that happens in our lives. That seems to be patently untrue. Uh, physical illness, yes, that's the body. Trauma, that's the mind. Both are part of the city in the mirror. The underlying awareness which experiences the traumatized body and the sick, uh, traumatized mind and the sick body, that awareness is neither traumatized nor sick. How do you know? Well, physically body can get sick. Awareness does not get sick but experiences the sickness in the body or allows it to be experienced. What about trauma? What about guilt? What about negativities, patterns, you know, compulsive behavior, all those things in the mind, in the speech, and all those uh, patterns, negativities. Those appear and disappear in consciousness without leaving a trace. If we say that consciousness continues to shine in deep sleep, where is the regret, where is the trauma, where is the negativity, uh, where, where is the good things or the bad things, whatever is in the mind, you're completely free of it once the mind shuts down. Once you forget it and move on to something else, when you're dreaming, that whatever was going on in the waking world is forgotten. When you wake up, whatever the horrible thing that was going on in the nightmare is forgotten. And in the waking world itself, between one flash of cognition and another flash of cognition, there's always a gap. We don't see it. One arises and goes away. And the Buddhists were right. Kshanika Vijnana, uh, the uh, continuous series of momentary flashes of cognition. In between there are gaps where there is no cognition at all. The mirror alone shines, exists. 